We looked at the areas of nuclear development, economics, international business, and international finance. Now we are going to look at the third P of the marketing mix promotion. But because we are going to look initially at push strategy, push is to push the product to the customer, usually done to the salesman, we can now study the MBA code area of human resource management, especially motivating the salesman and so on. So we are talking about promotional strategy. These days the word promotion is often referred to as simply marketing. And they say marketing, we think of the four pieces of marketing, but most marketers think mainly of promotion. They also call it Integrated Marketing Communication or IMC. So if they're starting, if your marketing guys are starting with IMC, they're really talking about the all of the areas of promotion. Now there are six principal ways of communicating in the market. They are field sales operations, personal selling, that's what we're going to look at now, the salesman. Media advertising through radio, TV, cinema, newspapers, periodicals. Internet, of course, huge now. Big businesses like Google, Facebook, and so on. This internet as promotional tools. Sales promotions such as samples, contests, exhibitions, displays, direct mail, and public relations, publicity. Now, there are areas that are sort of in between these areas. Uh, there is also packaging, instructions, image, and health warnings. So there are other things that sort of cut across, like spam. That's one way of promotion, okay? Um, these call centers and, and uh, cold calls, all of these areas would be part of promotion, okay? Now, one of the things that we find marketing people using is the term 360 degree marketing. 360 degree marketing is that wherever you turn, you see the message, okay? Now, when some years ago to Australia, when the movie King Kong was coming, we had a good example of 360 degree marketing. We also found it when the when Da Vinci Code the movie was coming and so on. Essentially, when you looked at the billboards, King Kong is coming. When you open the Time magazine, how they made King Kong. Look at the television, King Kong. Everywhere you turn, King Kong. Okay? This is 360 degree marketing. Every single way of communication is used to promote the film that is coming. What happened? Well, the young kids went huge crowds in front of the movie theaters for the first two or three days. But inside the movie theater, it's quite a long movie, halfway through, the kids took out their phones and they said this is a piece of CRAP to their friends. Okay. So what happened was the crowds fell after that. So this is the power of the personal recommendation to the social media. Personal recommendation, this is what Obama used for his election campaign. You are getting the message not from some company or some advertising agent but from your friend that you trust. Okay, so these days very very many companies such as Coca-Cola for example Okay, they basically set up their own blog site, even there's a Coke Zero blog site, pretending that he's a Coke Zero fan, but it's actually the company. And trying to say, oh, you know, trying to be like a young fellow, talking about the great things about Coke Zero. So they're trying to get more and more into the social media to try to pretend that you are a well-known, you know, you are a person of some that you can trust. So, okay, advertisements on Facebook would be like that. Okay, so this is the area of integrated marketing communication. Okay, so the promotional mix objectives, these marketing communication approaches are called the promotional mix. Often they seem to refer to as marketing. They are used in various degrees and make up the total integrated marketing communication or IMC strategy. They should be designed to achieve optimal efficiency in the use of the company's financial and other resources. The manager accountant must be aware of the many objectives of promotional strategy. 
The main objective is to make a sale. Now remember that this word make a sale is not only quantifiable, hopefully achievable, but you can see that when you make a sale, it is a quantifiable, either in terms of sales revenue or the number, it's a quantifiable objective. Of course, to make a sale, there's a whole host of subsidiary objectives geared towards achieving the main objective by pulling the customer towards the product, which is the area of advertising, and by pushing the product to the customer, which is the area of sales. So now we look at controlling field sales operations. So we're going to look at the control framework in the area of salesman and in that way we can study human resource management. Okay, so we'll go through the objectives, analysis, all of that in terms of the sales. Now there are both quantifiable and non-quantifiable sales objectives. Despite Peter Drucker saying, I need a object must be quantifiable, in the sales area there are certain non-quantifiable objectives. So non-quantifiable objectives are customer goodwill creation of customer goodwill, although even this these days through surveys we can quantify to some extent. Product image, market intelligence. The quantifiable objectives are whole host. These are only some of these. Sales volume, market share, number of new accounts open, expense to sales ratios and work rates. A whole host of them. The counter must work along with the marketing manager to define selling objectives in terms of what sort of volume they have to sell, market share, contribution targets, expense budgets, and all of this, of course, will be based on the sales forecast. Now, if you remember, many years ago when you had to do the budget, you start with the sales forecast. Same here. Okay? Now, how do you get the sales forecast? Well, one approach is to get the opinions of senior management and experts, the sales force itself, and their judgment. Surveys of buyers' intentions, so these days with the internet, you can send huge questionnaire surveys to people asking them what are their intentions okay, over the next three months in terms of purchases. Now I know a professor in America, he has a database of, I can't remember if it's 10,000 or 100,000 names, right? but he sends these out and he tells the people in the next three months, do you expect to buy any white goods, that is refrigerators and so on, and also TV sets and so on. And then he also asks, what sort of brands are you thinking about buying? So he analyzes the data, maybe he gets a 10% response. He analyzes the data, and that data he sells to the likes of Walmart and Kmart for them to do their inventory purchases. He makes a lot of money with these surveys of buyers' intentions. Marketing research and statistical analysis of internal and external data. That's all the data mining that we've done these days. All sorts of ways that you can come up with a sales forecast. Now, note that it's difficult to analyze personal selling from a cost standpoint because the sales force perform many functions in addition to promotion. They collect market intelligence, represent your company, trade and industry groups, and of course, they take part in the actual transaction. All of this is not part of promotion, but something else. So, sometimes when you try to use number of sales calls, to allocate the salesman's costs over promotion, you simply may not get the right answer because they do so many other things. Despite this cost analysis difficulties, however, it is important for the accountant to review what can be achieved through personal selling and provide such information to the marketing manager for him or her to decide priorities. Okay, now clearly these are objectives. And these objectives must be with meaningful standards so that we can know when we achieve the results. So you are really looking at the areas of responsibility for salesmen. Okay. So what we want to know what is the required performance of the salesman for in terms of product and product goods that you sell, sales areas, customer categories, what customers are you going to be responsible for. It must be based on meaningful standards. So here are some of them, there are a whole host of them. Cost to create one dollar of sales, average selling cost of each unit sold, cost to create one dollar of product contribution, cost per sales transaction, cost per customer service. Now you can go on like this with lots and lots of possible KPIs in this area. 
The next thing about the salesman is to give, to give their workloads and quotas. The formulation of the sales budget, the accountant must consider the budget of workloads and quotas. They must be realistic because they are basically evaluating effectiveness and also motivating the sales force. So in terms of workload, the main objective is to obtain a thorough coverage of the market. You want to cover as much of the market as possible. Consideration must be given to assigning reasonable tasks to each salesperson and routing the salesperson in such a way that cost of customer solicitation are minimized. So that cost of going to customers and getting their business would be minimized. In terms of sales quota, basically this is how we come up with a sales quota. Now this is a western approach. A grassroots quota is obtained from a salesperson based on the salesperson's estimate of market requirements. The advantage of obtaining this is that the salesperson feels that these are attainable instead of feeling reserved one about figures handed from above. Then what does the marketing manager do? The marketing manager takes that number and analyzes it in terms of the SWOT and GAP and VCG analysis that they do to make it into efficient expectations. Okay. Then what does the accountant do? puts a bit of reality into the numbers by looking at the company's aims and resources and the past performance of salespersons. So let's see how the number changes. The salesman says, I can sell 100. The marketing guy says, no, this is a growth market. Okay, we have a differentiated product, so we, can, we should make it 150. But the accountant says, for the last three, the salesman sold only 80. So let's try to make it 100 or 90 or something like that. So the number keeps changing. That is why in Asia, especially when I go to Hong Kong and Singapore and so on, they say they don't like to be asked what is your grassroots quota. They say, look, we know the number is going to change. We know that the final number we get has nothing to do with the number that we give. So don't worry us, don't annoy us. Just tell us what you want us to do. Okay? Don't ask for this grassroots opinion, which is a very Western view. Just tell us what you want us to say. Okay, and we try to say it. So that is the sales quota. The counter must keep in mind that sales quota do not necessarily coincide exactly with the final accepted forecast. Since targets are also motivational tools, they may be set slightly higher than the forecast in order to stimulate sales persons to greater effort. Such budgets are called challenging budget targets. It must be remembered, however, there is varying evidence of the usefulness of challenging budget targets. As often these result in non-achievement, there is a demotivation due to negative variances. So let's look at that. Okay, so here is a normal distribution of possible outcomes. So you have the expected value or the mean. So after your SWOT, BCG, all those analyses, you think that that is going to be the, the, the mean. But you set the budget target like more than that. This is called challenging. Okay, so not what you expect, but more than what you expect. Now it is quite likely that the actual result is going to be less than the challenging budget target. So the salesman may only achieve this amount. Doesn't matter, even though the variance is negative, they will still get a bonus or a commission. Because the actual number was here. Okay, so it is supposed to motivate them to try harder. But even if they fall, fall short, they still get their commissions and bonuses. Okay, that's one method. But the problem is, people don't like to see negative variances against their KPIs all the time. So because of that, another method has been suggested. That is highly achievable budget targets with penalties for non-achievement. So it's a reverse situation. If this is the expected value, you tell the person, you must do this budget. This is achievable.
And however, if you don't even achieve this, if you go below that level, then there are penalties. Okay, because this is the absolute minimum that you will allow your sales to fall by. So these are the two approaches you find. Of course, there may be some companies that don't have challenging or achievable, they just give you the actual figure for the budget. Any of your companies have sales people? None? Okay. Two companies. How do you do your three here? How do you do your commissions? Achievable? Actually, we are working as a shiverable because we got the forecast from them. Uh -huh. Okay? And uh, reduce it as per uh, our expectation and the market conditions. Yeah. Even we reduce it twice to just to get the minimum target to them and put it to them. And if they didn't achieve this target, yeah. they have to justify yeah. with uh, a reasonable reason. If it's ex acceptable, that means we will get next year because we are brought from But if it is not acceptable, are they punished? Please. Yes, they will not get commission. No and commission, but very no, no punishments either. No. no, no money taken away from them. Ma com commission is uh, the, the main money for them. No, it's the main money for commission. Okay. The what about yours? Uh, it's like they will be given a target. Uh -huh. And if they achieve more than 90%, they will get a minimum. And if they achieve more than 30%, then whatever the amount they sell more than that, they will get a good Okay, so you are basically close to the actual number that you want. But if they achieve about 95%, they still get a bonus. If they achieve more, they will get full commissions. Okay, probably closer to achievable again. And the, the only, the only, uh, they lose uh, the, their job if they didn't achieve the sales yes. anyway. And this is, this is the biggest uh, yeah. issue for them. And what about for you Yeah, this is the The very first class that I've had that there are three people who are closer to achievable than to challenging. Anyone has a challenging budget target? Yeah. Your level. Okay. But we don't have sales, but what we have is challenging target to the business partners. Uh -huh, right. Because we are principal company, so okay. we need the target to Right, right. Okay. What about your? We are This is a recruitment company, yeah. Okay. They have a we set a target for the three types of test targets. Anything that they make from that, then they will be able to take over that. So if the mid level staff, so to say, about five plus years experience, there's a target again set. It's all three times test targets. So at the moment it crosses three times, they get on the full building, they get, we usually give five months. <laughs> okay, so uh, interest in commission structure. So let's look at some in more details. Okay, now that is your meaningful standards and your workloads and quota. Now let's look at evaluating alternatives. Okay, and you can see I put CVP analysis there. I told you on the first day, it's a tool that we have that is often neglected by this accountant. Let us see a good way of using it. Okay? So, essentially, if you are using CVP analysis in the sales budget, it requires you to classify sales force costs into fixed and variable elements. Typical fixed costs are salary, depreciation on cars, fixed car expenses, such as vehicle registration insurance, and superannuation. Superannuation is the Australian term for pension and other payroll expenses. The variable sales force costs include commissions, travel expenses, entertainment, and fringe benefits tax. You can see that some of these variable is based on activity, others based on volume, and so on. Okay, so let us take a simple example that you want to evaluate the impact of a salesperson who's going to cost you $10,000 per annum fixed. 
okay, with the expected of selling 50,000 worth of products, and that is five times the fixed amount. But also, the commission, the variable cost, including the sales commissions, is 0.55. Okay. So that means a simple equation would be that your incremental segment contribution by hiring this one person is $50,000 of sales minus 55% of 50,000 unique variable cost minus the fixed cost of 10,000, 12,500. So it is worth hiring this person. Now if you have a second person, then you, the fixed cost will go up to 10,000. You can't expect the second person also to sell 50,000 because there is what is called the law of diminishing returns. So let us say that the two salesmen together sell 90,000 worth of sales which means that the incremental contribution will be 90,000 minus 0.5590,000 90, minus 20,000 and that works out to 20,500 which means that the incremental contribution of the second person is not second person alone but them together is another 8,500 so like that you can go on doing this theoretically until there is no more contribution but in practice, that's not going to be the case, okay? Because you will have some sort of margin of safety. Any question? No, no. Right? There will be some sort of margin of safety. Now you can see it's a very, very useful way of looking at hiring salesmen. But whenever I go and ask the marketing section or sales department how to <coughs> hire salesmen, none of them know this simple calculation. Or they all say, oh, we thought we needed another salesman because we want to cover a certain area. Or we thought that there's a new product coming, so therefore we needed some salesman. But it is a very simple and powerful calculation. How much is the salesman expect to sell? What is their commission structure? And how much is their fixed cost? Okay. When you show this to them, you say, this is a good method, but they, they don't use it. It's a surprising thing. Okay, so this process is currently under the point at which additional salesman does not add to increment sales contribution, but there would be a margin of sale. Okay, you have to also remember that throughput has not increased, so you can't keep on adding salesman even if there's a margin of safety, because there may be other fixed costs. You may need the more officers, more rent of space, so you must make sure that other things have not changed. Okay, now let's look at implementation. Here are some incentive schemes. So long with implementation, remember, the predictive model, in this case it will be the salesman, and there is the importance of the reward system. Sales persons are the first frontline contact with customers and potential customers. Consequently, the proper motivation of sales persons are already considered vital to the success of the enterprise. There are various types of incentive schemes such as company profit sharing, that was very good for empowerment situation, bonus, sales revision, salary revision, sorry, salary plus PO commission and PO commission, salary plus commission and PO commission. Now let's look at two of these methods. One is commissions. This can be based on sales volume or sales, sales value or sales volume. It is better that they are based on net sales, that is goods invoiced, less returns. Because that's otherwise going to have the Indian problem, which is that they invoice, invoice, invoice at the end of the month, and they get their commissions on it, and then return, return, return at the beginning of the next month. Okay, where they invoice is going on with their uncle's company. Okay. Uh, and even better is it if it's on money collected. A salesman, of course, hate this. They say, money collection is your problem, accounting guys. They can sell. You better collect the money. So they sell to all sorts of useless people, and accounting has, is in charge of talking about the bad debts. So ideally, if you can, money collect them. Now, how do you all do it? Money collect On the collection. Right. Same? No, on the sales. Uh, because we, we, our contract for two years, three years, so yeah. you cannot wait for the collection after three years to get this commission. So it's getting on the sales. Okay, but I've had situations in the insurance business where they sell 
one said an uh, insurance contract that carried all the money up front and then the client never pays and all these sorts of things happen. Okay. Credit cards? Same. Yeah. So in the credit card system, you must be estimating the sales that you're going to pay the commission on because you haven't yet got the sales, isn't it? See, you know, the commission was like, numbers, what sort of commission structure was that? Challenging or achievable? Achievable. achievable. The budget was 50. Okay. They were able to eat, the budget, sorry, was over here 50. They were easily able to beat, beat the budget. But this one, obviously, product A is a bit difficult to sell. So there's an incentive rate here of 5%, but there's a negative because they've gone under budget. Penalties are not achievable. So this guy takes home an overall commission, okay, but by not selling up to product A, that has got a negative result. Now, of course, if they have negative in all three, then for the first two or three months, you will not take money away from that person. But if the person has a negative value four months in a row, you will tell that person you are not a salesman, you are the other company. Because you, the salesman getting a negative for an achievable budget target uh, is something like that. Okay, so that is one example. Sorry? Counting all easy things. IFRS, you can get a computer to do it. Okay. Now there are many types of bonus schemes, including company profit sharing and prizes such as paid holidays abroad. Here's an interesting one. Have a look at this. Okay, the budget is this level here. But this, these people are getting a bonus. This can be even for a commission, the same thing. Even if you don't meet the budget by minus 8%, you're getting your commission. What sort of budget is that? Challenging or achievable? Challenging. Challenging. Okay, challenging because even if you don't meet the budget, you're still getting paid. Budget is less by 8%. Now here the interesting thing is, you're getting plus 2, plus 5, you're getting more and more commissions or bonuses, but if you reach more than 8%, commission goes down to zero. So why, why doesn't it go up, 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 up like this? After all, some people are saying that the more you sell, the more commission you get. In this case, why are they looking up? Barrier on how much you sell. Right, coming down to zero. Well, I mean, 100 here, but basically coming down completely. Collection risk. Collection risk may be one reason, but the small one. Huh? That could be another reason that we don't want it to go above capacity. There is a notice also before a decline. It's mean stable even from 2% up to 5%. The commission. Yeah, well, 5%, 6%, well, yeah, 2% to 5%. That means it's not increasing as well. Yeah, and then it's coming down, okay. yes. So, so why? why? Why doesn't it go up like this? Okay, there is a capacity reason, there is a collection reason. But the main reason is, remember that this is a challenging budget target. You are not supposed to get 10, 15, 20, 30 percent above a challenging target. Okay, this is like telling that you you are normally a past student. You will want you to get a distinction, and you are getting a higher distinction than more than 100 percent. Okay, something is wrong. So, one thing is that there are two main games the salesman play at budget time. Many of you know these games. Game number one. 
is underestimate the budget. Okay, so this is appears to be a challenging budget, but it is not obvious okay, because they are doing the underestimation, so that they can oversell the budget and get their commission. So by doing this, you are preventing that. Game number two is quite interesting. Overestimate your budget. Why would they do that? That happens especially when the product is in a mature product or a declining product. If you tell the management actually that we won't be able to sell much of that product, you might lose your job. Why should we help you then? So what do they do? They overestimate the budget and save their job for one more year. At the end of that year, they will come up with all sorts of excuses. Competition came up, the government regulation, new technology, all of these things, but they save their job for one year. So these are the two... Short-term strategies. Sorry? Short-term strategy. Yeah, but better than losing the job. Okay, and worry about that. And they quickly go finding another job during that one year. Okay, so this prevents there is games from being played to some extent. But that is a, a reason for setting up a limit for your sales. But there's another reason as well. And that is something that is not only related to sales, but if things are going to well in life, something is wrong. Things can't be that good. Okay, if you are expecting sales to go up, 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 way beyond your expectations, then something is happening in the marketplace that you have to be careful about. Now, a good example of this is what happened in Sri Lanka 40 years ago, maybe 50 years ago. We had one tobacco company in Sri Lanka, British American Tobacco. And then some local rich businessmen got together and set up a small company called the Lanka Tobacco Company. And they got some machinery and started making one brand of cigarette. British American Tobacco had about 10 to 15 brands. But this one brand was a major, major success. The sales were off the roof. The product was hitting the little shops, okay, and just flying out of the window. Major success. And this sales continued three, four, five, six months. They couldn't keep up with demand, right? So they decided to take a major loan from the bank, order cigarette making machinery from England only 40, 50 years ago. It had to come by ship. Meanwhile, this product was going flying off the shelves. They installed the machine, they upped production 10 times, and all sales stopped. No one bought anything. What was the story? Machine. <laughs> <laughs> brand new machines. The old the machine old is better. Machine. <laughs> yeah. the the machine. Machine. No, I don't want the machine, but, but this is brand new machines. Why this sales suddenly stop? When things are going too well, look over your shoulder and figure out what's happening. What is happening? Anyone, anyone has any ideas? You know the story, yeah? Yeah, that's exactly, okay, so he's a, things like the Sri Lanka. That's exactly what has happened. The British American Tobacco had a sales force of over 100 salesmen. Lanka Tobacco Company had one salesman. British American Tobacco went into every shop. Whenever Lanka comes, they have to stop. Don't put it out to sell, put it under the shelf. We'll come and collect it and pay you for the whole thing. Right? And if you tell anything, no more supply of cigarettes to you. Yes, yes, yes. So Lanka came, put, they put under the shelf, gave it to Sri Lanka, they went and basically burned it. Just burned it. And kept on doing it. They had the money to do it. Kept on doing this until the new machinery came. And then they told the salesman, okay, don't buy it. So the, the actual end use had never smoked the cigarette. Okay? And of course, the company went bankrupt. And who was there waiting to buy brand new tobacco making machinery? The British American tobacco. So now, 50 years later, only one tobacco company in Sri Lanka. No one has ever started another one. Okay, so when things are going too well, be careful. Okay? Those who are not married, if your girlfriend is too good to be true, <laughs> okay. So, anyway, uh, this is the story. Now, interesting thing about competitive activity, that's nothing to do with sales, is also what happened in India. Some of you might know this story. Okay, in, in about the, 
I think it was maybe about 20 to 25 years ago, there was this rumor that Coca-Cola was cocaine. The secret ingredient of Coca-Cola was cocaine. And the Indian government got a bit concerned and asked Coca-Cola for their secret formula. Coca-Cola said, we promise it's not cocaine, but we can't give you a secret formula. Then India said they didn't have to go, and Coca-Cola left. Pepsi-Cola came into the country the next day and told the Indian government, we don't have cocaine, like you know, Coca-Cola does, but we don't have. Right? And Pepsi was in the market 25, 30 years, I think, until Manmohan Singh came, who was finance minister at that time, now his prime minister, and he opened India and allowed Coke to come back and Coke said, we don't need to know your secret formula by then. By that time, it was not an issue. So Coke came back. Now, Pepsi, remember, dominated the market for 25, 30 years. And within three to four months, there was not a single Pepsi in any shop. It was only Coca-Cola. How was that possible? How did they take away? The device said, be careful of your supply chain and everything. What happened? What did, how did Coke lose? Uh, Pepsi lost 25 30 years of market dominance overnight. He sent the back rumor to Pepsi. Sorry? Bad rumors in India, everything is a bad rumor, so that doesn't work. Okay? <laughs> okay. Okay, let me give you a clue. Let me give you a clue. Both Pepsi and Coke is sold in bottles in India. They took the empty bottle. I think they can take so many empty bottles. Yeah, those are when you have a small domestic driver, you can do that. But Coke against a big multinational like Pepsi, impossible. Possible, but how? <coughs> That's what they did, but how? You said Coke says going around to collect all bottles? Not feasible. How did they do it? You bring it to the and get one free. Huh? Bring it to the bottle and get one free. Huh? Bring it to the and get one free. <laughs> that could have been okay, but it have showed Pepsi what they were going to do. Yes? No. In fact, Pepsi caught copy books, that is that bottle. Okay, what was an important issue of outsourcing? Pepsi Cola had outsourced its bottle collection, washing, and filling of their product to a private company. This is the issue of outsourcing. Coca Cola visited the private company in the night and gave them 10 times the market value of their company and bought it but said, why? So now Pepsi's bottling plant was owned by Coke. So all the bottles now came to the bottling plant, they just crushed it. They didn't even put it aside, crushed, and told no bottles to fill your Pepsi. Meanwhile, they said, when they said, Pepsi didn't come, try Coke. Okay? And that's how they got it. Pepsi and Coke ate each other in India. <coughs> you go to Connaught Place in, in um, uh, what, uh, Delhi, and there's a sign, Coca Cola upstairs, big sign. Someone has it, <coughs> Pepsi everywhere. Right? Coca Cola upstairs, Pepsi everywhere. Someone has it. I mean, they hate each other. But the interesting thing, first of all, the lesson is protect your supply chain as much as possible. The second lesson is that about not even a year later, Pepsi did the reverse to Coca Cola in Pakistan. Pepsi bought Coke's bottling plant in Pakistan and crushed all the bottles. So I don't know why Pepsi and Coke in the two countries are not talking to each other. This okay. is what happened. Sorry. Yeah, something like that, something like that. Okay, now, protecting your supply chain. Extremely important. What is the biggest outsourcing blunder ever? The biggest outsourcing blunder ever was done by IBM. When they outsourced their operating system to Bill Gates. They had a board meeting when they put out their first PC. And they said, oh, Hardware is the most important thing, not the software. They just find an operating system. Bill Gates' mother was at the board meeting and went and asked Bill, hey Bill, son, what is this thing called operating system? Bill said, I don't know. Okay, Bill actually, I don't know, let me find out. 
and when they found out what operating system was, and he bought over DOS, this operating system, but he didn't sell it to IBM. He rented it to IBM on a per unit basis, and the rest is history. IBM's hardware was not the thing, it was software. And IBM actually outsourced its whole future with that one thing, and today, of course, it is their PC division is Lenovo. Okay, so you can see, be very careful about the competitor who wants to break into your market will look at your weakest link in the supply chain. Control reports are usually filled by salespersons. And sophisticated data entry and scanning facilities are available to complete these reports on an ongoing basis. These are the reports that salesmen fill to tell the company what activities they have done, what sales they have made, what customers they have visited, and so on. Now in the old days, in the very old days, and if I tell you how old you know my age, okay? When I used to, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, when I when I used to be auditing Unilever, they didn't have any computer facilities and so on and so forth. They had a thing called the Kalamazoo system. Right. Now, the Kalamazoo system was where salesman went out with a with a city hardwood with lots of paper and there was between the sheets of paper carbon paper. The young people they don't even know what carbon paper is. Okay, do you know what carbon paper is? <laughs> right. Okay. So anyway, you you go to a place and you fill in the customer name and how much is ordered and so on. And then one sheet goes to inventory control, another sheet goes to invoicing, another sheet goes to uh, accounts with the world and so on. They still have all of them. Okay. In India. And they must, even Sri Lanka also still has Kalamazoo as a company there. Okay, maybe India as well. So these days, of course, those systems are no longer required because even, say, many years ago when you go to McDonald's, they don't press what your bunch is. You have a button for cheeseburger, a button for uh, Big Mac, and so on. Okay. And so, these days there are huge computer facilities uh, that uh, 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 things that laptop that people take and often with the iPad is becoming now commonplace for them to take these sorts of very sophisticated data and scanning facilities. In fact, these days is hardly anything that the salesman needs to write because why? The car would have a GPS system. And the GPS system would know exactly what customer that is stayed at. It would also be able to say what time, average time that they spent with that customer. Okay. Um, would take a lot of that information. All the salesman has to do is to just click okay, what the sale is. And everything else is done automatically. Now, of course, salesmen hate GPS. They hate it. The reason is that. Those days, they used to go to see their girlfriend or go for a movie and say that they went to see a customer. Now they can't do that. Okay, so it's very strange how in Australia so many of these GPSs don't work. Oh, the GPS is not working. They have disconnected. Okay. So anyway, their facilities are available. The accountant must recognize the fact that the time the salesperson spends in completing reports is time lost in selling. Now the main purpose of these reports is to convey information regarding orders received, market conditions, sales force progress, product marketing performance, stock control, etc. The following are some of the typical control reports that are prepared. Whole host of them. Daily call reports, journey plan sheets, reports on customer contacts, order summaries at the individual salesperson level, monthly weekly sales reports by segment. Reports summarizing the total sales picture, order status reports, delivery achievements, complaints analysis at a regional level. Now it's only a few things that you need the sales going to actually write. They've got to show what, I mean the GPS knows where they are, so they just have to say how much the sales are done, and if there was any complaints about the product and so on, and everything is automated. That's what I can see that a good management information system will cut down time spent on report preparation by sales. Now, if you are looking at the performance evaluation of the field sales force, performance evaluation. What is the accountant's role in push strategy? The management accountant is unlikely to be required 
to set up a sales force, plan territories, or engage or manage sales persons. He or she will, however, be interested in how well the sales force performs and whether it gives good value for money. So this involves evaluation of performance against objectives, so it's real theory of variance analysis. So, manual accounting, the measure of sales force performance as the objective, evaluation of the performance with the purpose of compensation and promotion of sales persons. So, you need to calculate this performance manual because of the reward system. Present assignment for the sales force, of the sales force, in terms of the territories or products. So, what are they responsible for, what territories are they responsible for. Effort to see if it's been directed in the most profitable way and deviations of quantifiable sales of things. So lots and lots of uh, ways we can find this out. I mean, you've seen this before. We can look at performance in terms of sales volume, profit contribution, work rate, quality of the sales call. Quality means the amount of time that you spend with the sales with the customer compared to the number of products or services that you can sell. Efficiency in the sales for deployment, productivity, and so on. Okay, here are some of the methods of performance measurement that the management accountant will, uh, by the management accountant that we use to for the marketing management. Management accountant can measure the intensity of sales first by the number of sales calls. So that's work rate. Quality of the sales calls the number of orders for calls. So if you do five sales calls, how many orders do you get? If you get four or five, that's a very good quality of the sales call. Efficiency of sales for deployment is concerned the effectiveness of, man of management in maximizing the profit return per sales person. So we will see how this can be calculated in a table that I'm going to show you in a little while. Sales productivity, this can be improved, for example, by reducing the sales to cost ratio. And also, lots and lots of ratios we can do in terms of sales management control. So lots of things that the market manager, that the accountant can do that will help the marketing manager. Okay, so here's a good example. Let us say that you have these six things. The number of salespersons, the total salesperson remuneration, the number of calls, the number of orders, the total sales, and the product attribution margin. Now out of this, only one of these, the number of calls, that is the number of sales calls, is not in the accounting system. Everything else is in the accounting system. Okay? You have that in payroll, you have that all in payroll, all of this is there except for the number of sales calls. So if the salesman just puts, I visited this customer, that's one sales call. Now even without saying who the customer was, how long you spent, nothing like that, just number of sales calls, look at the information you can get. Okay, the average total of sales persons, average total cost, average number of calls, average cost per call, order call ratio, that's the efficiency. More, average cost per order, average order size, average profit contribution per order, average number of orders, or average profit contribution per sales person. So with just one thing, look at the amount of evaluation that you can do. So if you have a little bit more, like what, who is the sales call, how long did you spend, what products did you sell, what are your margins, you have a significant amount of information. So, we can do some sort of variance analysis. Some variance analysis. Feedback or variance analysis provided by means of a filtering process that will lead to the overall variances, positive or negative. So let's look at this one you may find that overall the sales force has done well. But if you break it down by segments, you might find that some segments are very profitable, others are making a loss, like the customer profit analysis that we did for Panther. The counter can put, then start with the worst segment and analyze it further by the sales person's performance. He or she can then take the worst sales person, worst sales person, and analyze his or her performance by product. Find the counter can take the worst product, performance and analyze the customers for that product. So you can do what is called drill down. Okay. Now this is exactly what the situation is. In the supersonic stereo case that you are having, 
where Charlie Lyons, the best older salesperson, is asking for more money and saying that if you don't give me more money, I'm going to leave the company. So let's see if we can use some of the information that the man in the company can take away to do this. You see that he's an executive information system. Company software now exists for reporting, uh, for such reporting systems, which are called executive information systems, you've come across this before. These have drill up and drill down features to analyze total sales, segmental sales, salesperson sales, product sales, and customer sales. Using such software, accountants can provide segment managers, sales segment managers, a fairly comprehensive picture for the actual research presentations. 